Hi, everybody. It's Martha Creek. I'm delighted to be here today. I again get to be with a treasure, treasure friend and colleague and yes, mentor. This is another mentoring moment with Martha. And to be clear, um, Reverend Nikki and I were having some fun before we started the recording that we're here to be mentored. We're here to share our mentoring out there with others and be clear that we're here as students as well as teachers. So we bless this. I know that uh, many of you have heard this before. MarthaCreek.com is the way to contact me. My uh, emails are there, phone numbers. There's also 150 free videos, podcasts, anything in the world that can be beneficial to you, you're welcome to. My mission is to serve those who serve. And my vision is to get empowered teachings to the whole of the planet. So this is offered today in accordance with that mission and vision. And it is my pure delight to be here. So thank you for joining, Reverend Nikki. Thank you for being here. For oh, taking, I'm most honored to be with you. Taking the time to do it. So as I was thinking about what we would talk about today, honey, that it seems to be important. When I think about these things that we're recording, we have no idea if it'll be seen by one person, by a million people, what's going to take hold, what's going to have a root system. So mm -hmm. think about it in terms of if somebody's going to be watching this or listening to this podcast or watching this video series a year from now, five years from now, 2,000 years from now, uh, what, what would you want them to know? What would be mm -hmm. your message that is something that if you if they if it, you could sink into them seep into them like you know people will say sometimes what would you say to your younger self or something so what would you want to be clear that if you take nothing away from this message today if you take nothing away from this conversation but this you're it. oh that's an easy one for me i would say focus on your own wholeness and keep your focus there and let anything that you feel like is not wholeness simply fall away yeah. So now you've opened it up, girl. So let's go. Because, you know, I right. a misunderstanding about wholeness and this is what I consider and even call lately this and it's I see that it's taken some root fake positivity. Mm hmm. Our wholeness. My wholeness is when I'm happy, happy, happy. My wholeness is when I'm in joy. My wholeness is, is when I have forgiven everybody for everything. So then that leaves the rest of us, the part that couldn't forgive, the part that's really give, given some good efforts to forgive, and it's not loosened us yet. It's not mm -hmm. unvelcroed from us yet. So speak about wholeness, what you mean by that, and your encouragement for us to spend in devotional time in celebrating and honoring our own wholeness. So speak about that. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I believe that we're created in the image of and as the likeness of God. So there is a wholeness there. And as spiritual beings who are in this human process or, or the divine human, some people like to call it, that divine human is perfection. But we're also in a personality and we've had a lot of experiences. Like I've had a lot of experiences. Some of those experiences have lifted me up and some of those experiences have invited me to believe that I'm less than, either less than who I could be or less than someone else. I believe even those experiences um, are part of my wholeness. They're just a part of my life experience. And so for me, wholeness is to be willing to focus on what I believe is true of me. And I believe what is true of me is true of God. And um, that I am love, that I am life itself. And life flows through me, but I'm also life because I'm here. And I believe that when I focus on those things, like if I focus on love, well, if I believe with some part of myself that I'm not good enough, I bring my love to the not good enough. And eventually, if I keep doing it, and if I'm willing to do it time after time after time again, then it chips away. And I know this is true because I've had that experience. Yeah, that's helpful to hear. I think it's important to point out here that it is process. Mm -hmm. And you're in process, processing and progressing as we go. And you've 
also clearly demonstrated here the need for the necessity the vital component and critical nature of spiritual practice mm -hmm. so have an awakening that I know of now uh, Eckhart Tolle may have had one or Byron Katie may have had one and the rest of us may be having ours moment to moment to moment not in a mm -hmm. big crash or something that it is something that we progress towards so I can't have the thought once I, well I am whole or that's included in my wholeness and then think I've really I'm all done here that was a tick box exercise when the next thought in could be more proof that there's something wrong with me, mm -hmm. or that I'm not lovable, or that I have no power, no safety, no value. So keep speaking then to your encouragement here and inspire us to in a way that would know that this is a um, not a tick box exercise, that it, it requires devotional, spiritual practice, emotional maturity, emotional undoing, and redoing, rewiring, whatever you would want to call that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just look at the idea of wholeness. Many people think it's static, but I believe it's actually dynamic. We live in a universe that the scientists tell us is expanding. So why would we think that our wholeness is static, that it's, it's a circle with this circumference or diameter, and, and we, we look for a, like an end product. But I believe just like the universe is ever expanding, so is my wholeness. So is my, and another word could be my transformation. Most people believe that they're not good enough or they're fundamentally flawed some, somehow. Or if you really knew who I was, you wouldn't like me anymore. Those are the thoughts that people have well, we learned those somewhere. And the beauty of learning those somewhere is that we can unlearn them. But we do have to do the work. And I believe the, the work can be playful. I believe it can be fun. For instance, think about it like this. What if the first time you got really angry, somebody started to cheer and say, yay, you're beginning to recognize the difference between yourself and another. I mean, to me, that's exciting. But I know that oftentimes people will try to say, uh, and I've heard parents say this to children, are you trying to make me mad? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. And I know I'm as bad because if there's a button out there, I just might push it because it's out there. And yet at the same time, no matter how much I push it, if there's not anger inside that individual, it's not going to show up. Right. And I remember, and this came from a, teen, a young, a young, young one, a young person that said actually to their parent, when she, the parent said, you're pushing my buttons, you pushing my buttons. And the young, the little, the young one said, they're your buttons. Like you install them. Mm-hmm. So if you don't want the effect of this button, it's like de-install it, like unwire it or something. So tainted the truth. Yes. Potential like there for us. So I had a, I did a series this year, um, Nikki, on the five invitations. And one of them had a very powerful image for me is that we are in our wholeness. So holistically and that mm -hmm. in a, an infinite field and that we are then cut into jigsaw puzzle pieces and that we then start to put back all the pleasant experiences we start to put back the things we're real proud of the things where we did a good job where we were at our best self and then there's there's big big gaps in the puzzle because we're not been willing to put in those times we were angry upset frustrated things we're not proud of and until we're willing to put those back in which i consider integration that they they're integrated they're they are included they were part of my human learning process they were a part of my divine human experiences mm -hmm. i'm willing to name them to claim them to put them back into this puzzle then i'm not experiencing wholeness so i can claim wholeness and parade around like some of us high righteous new thoughters do with it's all good it's all good i'm a perfect whole complete expression of of God, while I'm secretly believing I'm 
flawed, fundamentally flawed, and giving lip service to something else. So they speak about then that what you believe is the necessity to include all of us, to include all the aspects of us, all the experiences of us, even the ones we've judged or hated or disowned, depressed, suppressed, uh, denied the importance of telling the truth about that and getting that integrated into our whole being, into our wholeness. Well, I believe that anger is not bad, nor is it good. It's what we do with it. Same with sadness, same with fear. It's, it's about what we do with it. They're wired into our system. Now, they're not hardwired where they're unchangeable, but they're wired into our system. And most of us don't have any concept of how they get wired into our system. But what science has shown us across the years is that we have an experience that triggers an emotion. And the emotion, it's like the brain has taken a snapshot of the emotion. And so it has thoughts with it. And it could be something we delight in, or it could be something that startles us in some way. And whatever we bring to that experience, then we label most often. Say if I come in and um, into a room and I see an ex-partner and I, I suddenly have a cascade because of the perception and the thoughts of, of fear or anger. It's because it's, it's still inside of me. And um, it's not about that person. It's about whatever's happening in me. Well, I don't think that's necessarily bad. I think it's actually an invitation from the universe to clear up something that's been stuck in my body. And I believe that I can say, oh, it's awful that she's here. Or I could say, wow, what an opportunity to recognize where I'm still letting my energy be changed by the, by the presence of someone else. And then I can figure out what I'm going to do with it. I happen to believe that emotions are, um, once we get the trigger off of them, are, are, are wisdom. But until we get the emotional trigger off of them, then they actually will oftentimes run our lives subconsciously. And so me walking into a party or me walking into maybe a restaurant that I used to go with somebody that I'm no longer spending time with, and all of a sudden I have this trigger of emotions um, what a lovely opportunity to, to do some healing work on myself, not to blame anybody else, but, and not to even blame myself, but to go, wow, I didn't realize that I was still being captivated by that. I didn't realize all of those emotions were capturing my attention in such a way. And then I can turn them into some form of creative expression. I can do a breath work process. I can move because the moment we're cascading with those emotions, uh, science shows us that the limbic system has engaged and that the only way to disengage that limbic system is either to sit and settle the mind, which is a very difficult thing to do with either anger or fear. So I can get up and dance. I can move. I can do something. Uh, women for years have unconsciously known that cleaning, <laughs> you know, when, when they're, emotionally riled up to go and get the toothbrush out and clean the grout in the shower, which is something I do. I take out um, bushes and plants that are no longer wanted sometimes when I, when I have that upsurge of energy, because it's simply an energy that's running through our bodies. But somebody somewhere along our life has told us that it's wrong. So. Yeah. And, and, and that's just so important. There's so many things here, so many nuggets in what you're sharing, honey. So I'll just pull a few that this, this major transformational shift from stop other referencing to inner reference. Mm -hmm. So then whatever happened in the external, whatever happened in the outer triggered something inner me inside of me. And that's where the work is to see what is that about? And then to accept it to some place that it has its own energy, that I am, 
what appears to be hardwired, that's not literal, that it can be rewired, proven over and over again, that we can create new neural pathways for this. But in the meantime, I'm hardwired enough that I had an instinctual reaction to something that I didn't intend to, that I had a knee-jerk reaction, a knee-jerk response to this. So then how to be with self. And that's a beautiful expression of it, a beautiful energy of when nervousness comes, anxiety comes, sadness comes, grief comes, madness comes, these things that we've formally classified as problematic or not so good or bad or wrong or whatever is to understand their energy in motion, emotion. Mm -hmm energy in motion and I consider them like you it sounds like honey with a little different phrasing on it that they're portals that the feelings are portals to self-realization to see what is causing this so to walk it off burn it off kickbox it off dance it off safe anger work psychologists therapists have used for years to get a wiffle ball bat a little plastic bat or a pillow on your couch mm -hmm to the gym, a good hard walk when a couple of my clients go to a creek and break rocks mm -hmm. to, get, to get some of that energy unstuck and moving and to give it some space. So mm -hmm. anybody listening to this to give yourself some of this. So the opposite, the opposite of suppressing it, depressing it, disowning it versus giving it space and then if you can move, move, it, move it around and move it through and, and burn it off physically, then to do it and to get some practice too. And you really hit on that well, honey, to also get some time at sitting quietly, getting still, getting centered and giving it some space in that place. Uh, mm -hmm. So even though I might be maybe feeling like my skin is crawling off, it's very uncomfortable to sit my fanny down. That that's exactly what I'm going to do from time to time. Mm -hmm. See that um, it I'm having emotion and it doesn't have me, and the big big shift out of that de that day of discovery when I can see the emotions are big and they feel ravaging and waterfallish and overwhelming, and it's not true. That um, there is a way to be with these that's different that I'm just now discovering. So. Um, speak about in terms then of um, this giving emotion space, the value of this. So what would you say to having emotions and emotions not having you? Mm. Well, one of my favorite phrases to use is today is Thursday and I am feeling and then label the feeling and put the period. And I might need to say it 50 times, but to, to just go ahead and own it. Today is Thursday and I feel angry and put the period right after anger. And then I can say, well, where do I feel anger in my body? Where am I experiencing it? Well, anger typically shows up in the jaw. It shows up in the throat and it shows up in the shoulders. So I can notice, well, am I tight in my jaw, throat or shoulders? Because a lot of times people will say to me, I'm angry. And when we start the exploration of where they're experiencing the tightness or the bunching or the cording in their body, it's actually in their bellies. And so sometimes anger, um, what looks like anger is actually fear. And so when I'm willing to say, this is what I'm feeling, just the same way I would say today is Thursday. Like I don't get mad that today is Thursday, but it's just Thursday. It's just what is. And so what is, is what I'm feeling. Now the scientists tell us that we have something like 20 to 30,000 emotional experiences every day, but most of us focus on just one or two of those. Cause I've had people come and say to me, oh, I'm always sad. And I will pull out what's very archaic sometimes, but it's a chart that says, okay, are you willing to record your feelings for one day at 15 minute incre increments. And people are like, ah, oh, that's so stupid. But when I began to do that, or somebody else begins to do that, they start to say, oh, I wasn't always mad today. I had gratitude here. I had joy here. Oh, this was so much fun. I found myself laughing. And woven in between those may be the experiences of feeling mad. So if I'm willing to even just take a few moments at different intervals in my day and tune in. And it's like, oh, what am I feeling right now? Ah, oh, 
I'm feeling joy. Oh, oh, I'm noticing the heaviness in my heart. What am I feeling sad about? And it, it might be simply a wafting experience of an energy. But the moment I acknowledge it, then I have changed it. And I think that's important. And then I can turn it into creative expression. Then I can, or I can just sit with it and I can take a moment and hold, close my eyes and hold my hands on my heart and breathe into my heart, giving attention to that sadness. And it may rise up a little bit, but usually it will rise up and then it will release. Because I think oftentimes um, what our experience is, can, it can either come with a feather or it can come with the Mack truck. And personally, I like the feather. Amen, sister. And if you take nothing away from this call, it's like lean towards featherweight instead of yes. <laughs> into suffering, then this podcast is not for you. So, so we're the opposite of masochism here. And yes. Katie, who's been a teacher and, and that work, which is considered cognitive behavioral therapy, the work.com mm -hmm. interested speaks about this, Nikki, what you're sharing here and giving it its life, letting the emotion have its life. So it's rising to pass. It's present for my care, for my noticing it and it passes. And I love now, I'm a simple girl. I love simplistics. The simpler, the better for me. I've asked for all of my messages and my directions to be in two words or less. That's how simple I like it. So hearing this return to simplistics, to return to what you refer to as archaic or basic, I really want to lift that up and promote that here. That this is what you're describing is showing our wholeness through a full spectrum of emotion and that will tendency to say, I was mad all day. I've been mad all week. And it's like, there's nothing about that true. There's no one that is mad all day or all week. We don't even have the capacity for that. And we were mad for a minute and it didn't feel good. It was uncomfortable. And maybe for some of you, it felt really good. Tell the truth about that because it's also shown in the scientists, we're getting high off getting mad. We've mm -hmm addiction going on to being mad and the, mm -hmm. the chemicals that flow through that when we get to be offended about something or to take offense to something so um i would i would love to say a little bit more than about this the tendencies to diminish how well things are going how well i did how we have less tendency to praise our progress. And I'm absolutely not talking about a fake positivity here, but today I had measured my emotions and I recorded them in 15 minute intervals. And there was a range of a hundred in there, including anger and sadness and despair and other things. It also included um, um, looking forward to anticipation uh, joy, gratitude, relief, mm -hmm. uh, grief, and relief, that these have, a co these have common ground with us. So say more about the importance of allowing for this full spectrum of emotion and any encouragement to stop putting them in this binary filing system of good emotion, bad emotion, positive emotion, negative emotion. And you've, many of you have heard me say it before, this listen to the podcast that <laughs> that we traipse around going, oh, no, we don't believe in good and evil. Oh, no, we don't believe in good and bad. It's like we do. We call it positive and negative. Mm -hmm. Our next falsehood about it. So say, say what you can about the importance of declassifying these things and mm -hmm. moving toward inclusion. Well, I think as human beings, we like to label things, you know, get them in their compartment. And so the moment I can say anger is, is negative, then I can put it in a compartment. And so what happens is when it shows up, because it's going to show up because I'm a human being, it, it's going to show up when it shows up. I can, it's a way I can make myself wrong for one thing. It's also a way that I am going to um, unconsciously play old, old programming that's been subconsciously programmed into me by others. And it's a way that I can um, 
disconnect from the feeling is to make it bad. And so if I, I say something's bad and I, I'm trying to put it in its box and leave it outside the room, then I'm always going to have a bit of my energy attached to that box that I'm trying to leave outside the room. And if I'm instead going, wow, I'm mad. What is that about in this moment? Who do I feel like trespassed or betrayed me? What is that about for me? I wonder how I'm not standing in my power. I mean, it can lead us to places like this. It can also lead us to great creativity. I think about Beethoven. Ba -ba -ba -bom. He probably wasn't filled with joy when he wrote those notes. And yet so many other notes he wrote were filled with joy. So as long as we can have the full spectrum of life, allow it to be, wow, I'm mad. How can I turn this into creative expression? How can I dance? Like Monkey Man is a, is a song Amy Winehouse put out years and years ago. And it starts out with a beat of boom, 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 boom. I don't much like the words, but I love that beat. And so getting myself to move in that way, I'm moving in a way that's congruent with my feeling. And the moment I'm congruent with my feeling, I have an opportunity to let the feeling shift. As long as I'm trying to pretend that it's not there or that, no, of course I don't get mad, then there's no opportunity for the feeling to shift. My energy is actually pushing against what I'm trying to avoid. And that's, that's where my attention is. That's where my energy is. But if I can just allow it, science also shows us 90 seconds is how long uh, the brain moves through emotion. So if it's more, I always tell people, I'll give you two minutes of unenlightened ranting and raving. So have your two minutes, have a good time with it. And usually when people haven't, don't have a backlog of a lot of feelings, those two minutes are enough. And so maybe in an hour you take two more minutes and maybe in another hour you take two more minutes or you find a playmate. That's the other really cool thing. Get a playmate that's willing to play water guns, to have marshmallow fights, to pull out wooden spoons and have sword fights. This happens in our house all the time somebody, one of us will say, oh, I'm mad about something. How would you like to play? <laughs> That's the question. Would you like to play with me? And how would you like to play? And so then the wooden spoons may come out. The, the important thing when that happens is to remember to keep playing until the energy has cleared. Because it may actually rise up more and then clear. But a good marshmallow fight, you're not gonna hurt anybody. It's good to take it outside, but you're not gonna hurt anybody. But there's that movement, there's the throwing, there's the laughing when you miss, there's laughing when you hit somebody with the marshmallow. And it's it's a way of getting energy out. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear this, honey. So I wanna keep on this track of creative expression. You've used it three or four times. And I'm having a memory of my four-year-old great niece, Hadlin, who had driven in the car with me from Florida back to Kentucky, very long drive. And she had been remarkably uh, mature, m m m miraculously like present in her own place, watching things, reading, playing some games, listening to music, and she, our end, our end report, our end reward, our finish line was going to be Chuck E. Cheese. Ooh. And we drove up there and it's closed. Ooh. What happened in her and the fact that I didn't want to make that a problem. Like this is an honest expression. You know, I say that about kids. Kids tell you the truth and tell it to you always they always tell you the truth about what's really going on in their world and we used what you're describing to be to start some movement with and we use this motion in our eyes like give them the evil eye give Chucky the evil eye and she started laughing her ever loving head off until this day that has been helpful to process some emotion in her that's loss, that's grief, that's sadness, that's disappointment. 
something didn't turn out like we thought. And it's, it's, it's brought exactly what you're describing to it. So if you can't come up with something, those of you listening for creative expression, watch some children. Mm -hmm. uh, they can do it. And ha what, what a bright, bright, be a brilliant idea, Nikki, to use wooden spoons or some kind of sword with the children are going to want to use mm -hmm. uh, until we uh, shame them out of them or guilt them out of them or somebody gets hurt with it. So give them something they can do this with. So what are some other great ideas for play, for creative expression, to uh, care for emotions, to give emotion space, to... And I, what you're speaking about is even giving voice to them to say, I'm mad, I'm having anger. Uh, anger is present now. Eckhart Tolle puts it as that. Anger is present. Anger is arising. But mm -hmm. something that would keep us from judging it, hating it, blaming ourselves, recriminating ourselves, um, guilting ourselves over it versus giving it some space. And I call it name the ghost. Yes. And then once the ghost is named, then there's a relief that even comes with that, which you've demonstrated clearly. So what's some other forms of creative expression that could help us in this integrative process? Well, we could start with just our voice. Um, if we name the ghost, uh, say if I'm, I'm mad that uh, I can't go to the movies. I feel angry that I can't go to the movies. So let me just play with that. Then I can take that and I can use all kinds of different voices. I can be like, I'm mad. I can't go to the movies and I'm really mad. And somebody may say, well, that's so ridiculous about going to the movies. But if I'm truly feeling frustrated or mad, frustration is just a code word for mad, then what fun. And then I could do the Eeyore voice. I'm so mad. I can't go to the movies. So I can change my voice. I could sing it. I could do the operatic, I am so mad. I could do the country, I'm so mad. So we can just play in that way. And eventually, if we will continue to play that way, as we shift that energy, we're going to go to laughter. And the moment we're laughing, we're no longer in the grip of the emotion. It's like the limbic system has let go. What a lot of people don't realize is the moment that we have whatever thought that, that uh, triggers the feeling or whatever feeling that triggers the thought, in the brain there's a cascade of about 1,400 different hormones that, that go from the limbic system, boom, right down to the adrenals. And so what happens is if you think about this being the limbic system and this being our our, our neocortex, the newer part of the brain, this is our analytical thinking brain. When this is firing, this part has gone offline. It's limp. It can't fire. And so the movement, the creative expression, making sounds lets this fire until it rests. And then this part can go back online. It, it's really that simple, but it's very complex at the same time. But yeah. that's the simplest expression I know how so the movement the big muscle movement the vocal movement you can play around like you're a musical instrument like if I'm mad I'm not going to necessarily be a piccolo like but I'm going to be timpani boom 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 I'm going to be the trombone that boom you know I'm going to be the tuba or the fugal uh, horn I've never even heard of that word. So now I have to look it up, honey, to see. So it's very, it's very helpful to hear this, honey. And it's a, certainly a departure from our old archaic way of being with this to say that my, my, it would not occur to me to play this out of me or to play this through me if I don't have some kind of practice in place for that. Mm -hmm. And I often think about and have served with boards and all that over the years, as you know, and I give them what I consider foundational things for thriving ministry, for thriving boards, for thriving staffs that includes praying together, playing together, and this process speaks to that. So that also applies to the individual. And most of us have gotten too sophisticated and a little too uppity and big shottish to include any play in our lives. 
and including if it's going to be disclosing or make us uh, uh, even think that we're vulnerable in some way by having an emotion that's not considered uh, a good one or a positive one or something like that. So this has delighted me today to hear that these options for play, and it's also given me a lot of great ideas for how, because my family now has shifted. And so Hadlin's four, and now she's got um, in her nucleus of her family, uh, three more step brothers, half brothers, step sisters, half sisters. So they're they're all under six years old. Mm. So this is very very helpful to bring some ideas into them for how for them to be with these emotions. And I'm dedicated, devoted, not to hand down to them what was handed down for the last two thousand years of suck it up, buttercup, get over that. And I don't want emotions to run the show either. So. Mm -hmm this is helpful for me to be a bridge into that. Oh, that's great. When adult uh, kids get it, like if you tell a bunch of kids, drop out the words and talk to each other when you're mad, they'll do it. But getting adults past that, but modeling it helps. And then starting it out as play. Okay. So let's, let's, you know, you have this tone, you have, or this, blah, blah, and you have that blah, 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 and you have that blah, 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 and, and start with play, like a choir or something, and then ask people, are you willing to just once, and little by little by little, adults start to get it, and particularly if the, the leader is modeling it in a way that makes it fun, so, oh, and what was your tone? Blah, 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 blah. You know, or, and, and mine was blah, blah. Let's have a conversation and just play. And once people get to laughing, once they get through it to get to laughing, they get to begin to see, oh, well, that wasn't such a big deal. Well, and let's say that again. <laughs> imagine your life, folks, any of you listening to this, just imagine your life for a minute if these big deals, these big dramatic tensions and frustrations and e emotions, what if they stopped being such a big deal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because yeah. somebody made them a big deal to us, which is why we picked up it. Just think about um, somebody made them a big deal. So we picked up the belief system. Yeah. So every time I notice a big deal like that. Here's what I do. I'll go, okay, I'm pulling it out. And I'm going to throw it out the window. I'm going to pull that out of me. I'm going to throw it out the window. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's like a, 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 we've been taught by every faith tradition since recorded history, the notions of purification. So I just, that just as I've watched you visually and heard you, honey, the, the sound of it, it's like, purification so whatever you can do to purify some of this mm -hmm. hopefully this little talk today and our time together today has made that possible so i've been noticing honey the bible that's right behind your head it's one of my favorite bibles would you take oh, nice. it off that shelf and open it at random and read anything off the page we close okay. it. so we dedicate this is the Bible is not your book. It's fine. If the word God is not your word, that's fine. Use whatever words you can use. What we're offering here is for everybody. So we encourage you to take what you can use. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and to be blessed by that. And uh, let them know also Reverend Nikki, if they want to get in touch with you, how you practice and how they can contact you. Let's put that on the recording. Okay. All right. Well, here's the Bible. It opens to Jeremiah. And it says, and you now had turned, this is Jeremiah 34, 15. And you now had turned and had done that which is right by my sight in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor. And you had made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. We made it right, playing with our feelings, learning how to play, learning how to bring joy to anger or sadness or fear. 
is making it right, is part of that wholeness that we began with and learning how to fully embrace that wholeness. And pure liberty. Yes. Liberation. And the group says, Amen. <laughs> Thank you for that, honey, and for uh, what it brought me to, to revisit that. I, I passed that Bible on a long time ago, and I, I love being able to dip back in there. So tell us how to reach you then, honey. Okay. You can always reach me at um, my email is dr, like Dr. Nikki Golden, at gmail.com. I'm one of the co-ministers of Unity of Wilmington, so you can always reach me through that website, unitywill.com, and it's only one L, so unitywil.com. And um, if you just Google my name, there's an 808 phone number that comes up that looks like 808-389-6715, and um, that's still my phone number. Yeah. Um, so uh, Reverend Nikki is Reverend Dr. Nikki Golden is a teacher, a mentor, a co-minister. She's a student. She's a, she's a, a play, brilliant play expert, an emotional process expert. So anywhere in the world that you're called to serve with her or to be served by her, get directly in touch with her. And I thank you again for your time here. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure to spend time with you, Martha. And then MarthaCreek.com for any way in the world that I can serve you. And if this has brought you, um, for whatever this has brought you, co-inspire here together with us to get these teachings out into the planet. So send it to a friend or share it with a family member, somebody that's suffering, that's struggled just enough, that's tried other things, that uh, are looking for a new approach or new avenue. And we um, look forward to seeing you. Stay tuned for the next podcast, Mentoring Moments with Martha. And we'll see you along the way. Blessings and love, everybody.